So every district usually buys some form of diagnostic for numeracy. And I think it's really important that wherever you're starting as an educator, that you take the time to find out what diagnostics are in your building and read the instructions. Because one of the things, like for my own board, that every single school has a prime. Today, we speak with Kat Hendry, a teacher from John's hometown of Kingston, Ontario. Kat has shown her passion for many areas of mathematics education. However, in particular, she's very keen on the importance of diagnostics and descriptive feedback in math class and has been digging into why we need to focus more attention in this area. Stick around and you'll learn how to start your journey to implement diagnostics and descriptive feedback effectively without keeping you up all night worried with overwhelm. And you'll learn about the five phases of a diagnostic so you can utilize them in your teaching. Hey there, cue up that music. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are from Make Math Moments, and we are two teachers who, together, with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide, who want to build and deliver problem-based math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite your teacher moves. John, today we get the awesome opportunity, the honor to bring in a good friend and colleague and I guess a neighbor or a former neighbor of yours from Kingston, Ontario. Our friend Kat Hendry is going to be joining us for an awesome discussion and uh, we can't wait to bring this to all you math moment makers out there. Yes, I'm super excited. So let's dive right in right away, folks. Here we go. Hey there, Kat. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We are so excited to have you on the show today. We know you from way back and shot it with you many times, but super pumped that you are joining us here. So uh, we're going to kick things off, but just how are you doing today in this time? You know, it's kind of a weird time. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. I think we are all about to hit a fun stress level, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think that's pretty normal. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Kat, listen, we know you very well being a fellow Ontario educator and being involved with OAME. We get to chat when we get together for our annual conferences. But some of the others in the Math Moment Maker audience may not know about you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. What is your math teaching story and what got you into this crazy world of math education? So for me, I was actually like a kid that loved art and I grew up loving art and math wasn't very easy for me, but I actually ended up having this grade six teacher who loved art and math and he connected them often and he connected them well. And because of that, I started being able to like visualize math and it actually helped me a lot because I ended up like even now when I'm thinking about how things connect, I always have like the visual in my head and how that's going to interplay with the algebra and if I can bring that forward for students. And so he was a great teacher and it was like right timing, right place, right concepts that he brought together. And so I really appreciated him. And so that's sort of like where my love for math started because someone connected it to something else that I already loved. And I ended up, when I went to school, like I had applied for like a math degree and uh, for con ed, but I'd also applied for like medical school and like other things at the same time, like life science. Like, let's see what my, uh, let's do <laughs> where I get in decides where my yeah. path is going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. And I totally like was like, let's see what sticks. But it's funny because like my goal when I'd applied to university was to become a math and physics teacher. And so I got into a bunch of different things. And then I was like, okay, now I have to decide. Like, I thought the whole process was going to happen because somebody else was going to make me decide. And so then it was like, oh, God, I really have to think about this. <laughs> like, I think it was like, because I had this one teacher 
And I had several other teachers right after that teacher that really helped me to fall in love with science and math and like the visual side of all of that, that I was just really, really lucky, I think. But when I decided on Con Ed, and I decided on like I went to Queens, I ended up teaching internationally for a few years. And just a lot of things sort of clicked for me. When I was teaching internationally, I started to take like my ESL specialist. And I thought, There's a lot behind language and mathematics that is often unexplored. And then when I moved back to Canada, I lived in Belleville. And then I started having more questions about language and mathematics. And I ended up kind of bouncing around for a couple different boards before I landed in Kingston again. And the really interesting piece is that I ended up moving to Limestone District at the same time as I started my master's in math education. And I ended up working on, like, my master's was all about those questions that were coming out from language, from visual cues. Like, I had been working in Belleville for three years where I taught, it was, like, grade nine applied twice a day for three years. And I loved that program. And I loved those kids. And the things that you watched as they grew, it was so powerful. But there was always this piece about language that really held the kids back. And I didn't know how to improve it. Like I was working on a course in special education at the time. And the instructor of the course was like, you have a lot of questions. And I think you should actually think about doing a research project or a research program, because some of your questions, you might be able to find strategies and programs that would help you address those. And anyway, it was a lot of like the right time, the right place sort of thing. But I ended up doing a master's totally based on linguistics transference from the teacher to students. And it was really cool because it came like what I had discovered, I guess, is that it takes about three days for the academic language that we have as educators to transfer to students. And if we're not using that academic language, then students won't use it, won't pick it up. And then they can't fall into their highest potential for their use of academic language. Right. Yeah. That's super interesting. I didn't know that stat. And uh, it makes sense. Like when you said three days before it kind of transfers and just immediately reminded me, this is, you know, I don't know if this is going to sound silly, but it immediately reminded me of trying to get my kids, like my own personal kids to eat food when they were young yeah. <laughs> you have to try in order for them to any food John? no like uh, you know what i mean like you're trying to get them to like like carrots or something right and it's the first time they eat it they spit it out when they're like a toddler and or younger yeah. and you're like well yeah you read this stat you have to introduce food 15 times before they're gonna like it and i'm like okay well that just registered as a memory to me for what you just said about language and it makes total sense like if you're going to use the language the first time you hear that word or phrase or a connection to what you're teaching kids are just gonna be like that i don't have to think about that because they just said it but if you continually use it it makes a lot of sense and what i really enjoyed about your story was that you kind of said you were in the right place at the right time, but it was like, it seemed to be like you followed so many of your passions, like they all connected together. You're talking about your art background that kind of connected into going over and using it in this place. And then that kind of sparked this interest in language. And I feel like this all kind of flowed in this nice, almost like destined way to where you are now and and maybe even further. So I found your story very interesting. And I'd never heard all that before, Kat. I do want to connect it back to your teacher too, because we often ask or always ask our guests on the show to talk about a memorable math moment. And it sounds like you had one from that teacher, but I want to give you a chance to kind of articulate that or maybe talk about a different one. Uh, Maybe there was more to that, but is there anything else you'd like to add about your most memorable math moment before we kind of dive into some of the discussion here today that we're going to continue with? Yeah, probably I might talk about the grade six teacher just for a minute more, but there's actually another teacher that really kind of sparked my career, I think. But my grade six teacher, one of the things that he did is he transformed fractions for me. And he did it through art club. Do you remember, I don't know if this is like something everybody did when we were kids, but when you're trying to draw like a picture, but you're trying to blow it up, that you would make a grid Mm -hmm. and you would like section it up and like you transfer it over bit by bit. 
And so my grade six art club was, we would do large scale paintings from small drawings that we had done. And so this teacher had like shown me how to enlarge everything. And that to me, it was like an immediate connection of fractions. I understood them. I could apply my multiplication tables to something real, like a whole bunch of things kind of clicked for me. And it was all because of that visual. I wonder as well, and I don't know if this teacher was explicit about the math there or if that was just a connection that sort of, I often say, it's very easy for us in education, especially we, John and I, and I know you as well, we sort of promote this idea of investigation, of inquiry before students are, or rather than students just being told how to do things. And one of the downfalls or one of the pitfalls is that oftentimes we can give students an experience and in our minds, we just assume that they got it. We assume that they would pick up what we're throwing down, but that's only happening for some students. And some students make that connection. It seems very obvious to them. And then for this other group, they may not. And oftentimes they don't say anything. So I'm curious, just kind of throwing it back to you, like, was this something that that particular teacher was explicit about to draw that out and ensure that everyone in the room could kind of make that connection? Or was that something that, I guess we'll call you like a lucky one? You were lucky to (laughs) kind of have that like epiphany and go, wow, this is fractions. And the teacher's probably thinking like, yeah, of course it is. How did that happen? If you, I don't know if you recall or if you can explain. I actually remember him leaving the large paper with us or the canvas and saying, you have to figure how to enlarge this. And I've shown you on this previous drawing. So I'm going to leave this and you have to figure out how to scale it. And I can remember being like, I don't even know what scaling is. Hey, give okay. me three more days. Right? <laughs> yeah. <Isn't that> the <laughs> stat? <laughs> yeah. So that was the whole thing though, is that it took a couple of days to figure out how to scale that piece. And then I can remember going back and I was like, I think I've got the numbers worked out and I want to make sure that I've got this before I draw the whole picture out and find out that I'm a whole section short. And so I like went over things with him and then I can remember saying, this reminds me of working with my dad in construction, or this reminds me when we're doing flooring and we're putting in tiles. And you know what I mean? And I remember putting in a whole bunch of connections from my own home life. And I can remember having a conversation about fractions and being like, oh, it kind of reminds me of fractions and fraction tiles. But I don't remember us explicitly saying, yeah, this is 100% fractions. But I can remember we kind of danced around it. This makes me more curious, Kat, in the sense that and oftentimes people tell us their memorable math moment and it relates to something that kind of sparked a change. But you've clearly articulated this connection that, that drove you through this path the connecting math and art and visual. And I know that many of us, including you, are huge proponents of visuals in math class. So I'm wondering, like, how have you used this experience? Or maybe maybe I haven't thought about it back then, but how is this influence your teaching method, your teaching style, what you value in the math class in your practice today? So one of the things that actually happened is, so when I went through school and I went through my faculty of ed year and did my practice to like teaching like I was taught, my first few years, I definitely was teaching more like rote skill sets, etc. And there was one point when I had moved back to Canada that I ended up teaching art class and I did that for about a year and a half. And I had this reawakening of why am I not teaching math like an art class? Why am I not getting kids to do activities where they can see themselves in the activity? It's funny because once I had this sort of like thought process, I actually thought about how I was teaching art class. And why am I not incorporating math into the art class? And why am I not incorporating science into the art class? Because we would do things like cyanotypes in photography, right? And you have dark rooms. Like, why am I not talking about the chemistry of it? And anyway, it just made me realize how interconnected all of our curriculum really is. And it made me think about to be more thoughtful in the process of developing my projects or my questions or my activities in class. So 
when I was teaching the art classes, I started thinking about more about what I was doing, how I was teaching it, and how I can connect it because I'd have classes of 32 grade nines in a studio. And with those 32 kids, why am I not taking advantage of this to like practice any math skills that I can? Right? Yeah. And because every kid can use the practice. There's Yeah. That's a, such a interesting realization. And I wonder, I was reflecting and I was actually picturing you as if you were a teacher in my first school, Bell River District High School, when I was a teacher in my first five years teaching. And I was sort of picturing you in that school because I was reflecting on I guess how limited my own experience was because I only taught math. So I didn't get a chance to see what learning looked like in other subject areas, you know, and it makes me wonder if that's something that we're, you know, there's drawbacks, there's pros and cons to every model, but that sort of subject specific model of typically the math teacher only teaches math. I wonder if that holds us back at all. And I know for me, that might be something that I was missing early on. And it took me what I feel like a lot longer to sort of get out of that sort of gradual release of responsibility approach where I was kind of doing all the telling and the kids were sitting there just listening. And as we kind of continue shifting this conversation along, I really liked your piece about new terminology, new language. And in math class, something that I find is a struggle for teachers kind of moving or shifting or slowly transitioning away from more of a lecture format in a math class is there's this worry of maybe losing rigor. The word rigor gets used a lot. And yeah. Yeah. And they worry about like things like math facts and they worry about the things that you'll lose if we change. And I think there's a valid point for why teachers feel that way, because I think it's really easy for us to kind of swing all the way to the other side and sort of say math is only exploration. And that's why I asked you about the intentionality in that art class, where was it explicit that there was a math connection or are only some going to pick up on it. And something that really, I think, and what I really like about your work is that you have a focus in on the importance of the use of diagnostics and descriptive feedback in math class. And I think especially if you are shifting from, say, a more lecture format, I say more because there's always like a variance of how much people do one mode versus another. But if that's kind of heavily uh, note driven in a high school class, and then you want to shift to more of a problem based methodology, it is easy for some of those things to slip through the cracks. And this is where I think your focus on diagnostics and descriptive feedback really can help ensure that we don't lose those things. So I'm wondering, what got you kind of honing in on those pieces? Let's start with diagnostics. And why do you think it's so important for you in your classroom for your students? So I'm just trying to think about like what got me hooked with the diagnostics. And I think Part of it is one of the things that I was always strong at, and this started because of something that happened in high school. Do you remember like when you're in grade 12 or OIC, you always had to do like independent studies? Yes. Mm -hmm. ISU. ISU. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we had an ISU in my grade 12 math class that it was a really different style. You could learn maple. You could tutor a grade nine kid. Or you could go and volunteer at the elementary school across the road. And I actually went and did the volunteering at the elementary school and I was in a grade four class. And so when I did that, I actually did like a withdrawal support for these grade fours that were struggling. And they weren't struggling with the concepts in the math. They were struggling understanding what they were reading. And so most of my time was actually reading the word problems with them and asking them to rephrase the problem and asking them, what does it mean to you? Why does it mean that? And like what I ended up getting out of it is I felt like I got this really unique perspective on these kids because I got to see the best, right? Like I got to see the best of those kids because they got all my attention for like 20 minutes and it was just them and they got to tell me everything they knew about math and they knew it. And I think that's the thing with the opportunity for diagnostics is 
whether it's an interview or a written paper diagnostic, is you're getting to know your kids. And getting to know your kids is building a relationship. You're telling them that you care about their academic success, which in turn means that you care about their futures. And I think that that's something that teachers do. We all care about our students' success and their futures, but I think that we don't always say it and we don't always have these things that show it per se. And I think that doing the diagnostics, you get to see who your kids are as individuals, how they think. You get a little bit of like, if you're doing interviews, you get some like alone time with them. But even if you don't do the interviews and you do the paper-based diagnostics, then when you're going over that data with them, once you've checked them over and you're talking to the kids about their skills or their skill gaps, you're developing a relationship that's telling them, I really care about you and I want to see these gaps closed. And I think that that development of that relationship, what it does in the long run is like when you go back to that and you reassess them later on and you can show them your growth, like the growth that they're going to have and they're going to feel pride, they're going to feel success, even if they're not where they should be in terms of their grade level, they're going to feel so good about all the accomplishments that they have had through that time that you've been together, you know? I wanted to get a visual here because I think when people say diagnostic or diagnostic assessment, I think a lot of teachers are going like, is it a quiz that I give them? Is it a test that I give them on paper? Or like, is it a math test? The way you're talking, Kat, it sounds a little bit like that, but a little bit maybe different. So I'm wondering, what does your like best or your good practices in designing these things? Like, I know that it does make a lot of sense to say you're trying to get to know students. Some people will argue that I don't need a test to kind of, I just can listen to them during an assignment or their work period. What does the best practices look for you so that we can get a good picture of what you think it is good? Because people are going to be like, well, she's talking about diagnostics. I'm just going to go give them a little quiz right now. Yeah. So when I'm talking about diagnostics, a loose definition of them would be something that is a standardized diagnostic test assessment that has been developed by a source that is grade level appropriate or checking for skills that lead to the grade level that I'm working in. So most schools have bought diagnostic packages. And so over the last few years or in the past few years, I had worked as a consultant. So one of the diagnostics that I worked with was like the prime number and operations diagnostics through their Marion Small developed. And I personally really like that one. But I like it, I think, because of how strand particular it is. And I like it because I can see where it's going. I can see its connection to the curriculum. And it works all the way through elementary. So when I get kids in grade nine, I can actually use the last end of the diagnostic test because they have parts like A, B, C through to F and G, sorry, G, I think. Right. I guess I'm just going to continue to list off alphabetical terms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in the last section of the diagnostic, you can use it just to check to see where students are with decimals, fractions, percentages. And that's usually a big hit for grade nines when they come in is that they don't really understand rates and they don't understand fractions and decimals and percentages, truly. I can totally relate because in my district, we also have prime. And in particular, we generally focus on number and operations. It's interesting because I'm so happy you described, well, first of all, one that I know, because now I'm like, okay, we're on the same page here. And it was going to be a question I'd ask later about trying to clarify because Sometimes when people hear us talk about certain terms, they have a vision in mind of what that might be, what it might look like and sound like. And when using the prime diagnostics, sometimes I think teachers feel maybe overwhelmed when they hear the term diagnostic and they think that before every single lesson, thou shall yeah. do a diagnostic <laughs> assessment on yeah. the area of a trapezoid or whatever the topic may be, like almost niching down to the point where it becomes overwhelming and probably not that helpful. Do you mind giving just kind of like a broad sense of one of these, they call them tools, and then maybe we could talk a little bit about the phases, the five phases that are shared through Prime, because that might give people like a better idea of like, okay, 
this is, I guess, how often I would be using this particular diagnostic, not suggesting they can't use others, but just to give them a sense of what that looks like, sounds like. Yeah, I am just going to mention, like, so every district usually buys some form of diagnostic for numeracy. And I think it's really important that wherever you're starting as an educator, that you take the time to find out what diagnostics are in your building and read the instructions. Like, first off, just read the instructions. That's important. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Because one of the things, like for my own board, that every single school has, has a prime kit for number and operations. And there's also leaps and bounds, et cetera. And there's a few other kits that are kind of around by different publishers. And I think that it's important just to know what your school has and where it's kept, like if you need to copy things, because having those copies kind of ready to go actually makes it a much smoother process. And anyway, I just think it's really important first to know what you have in your building, because you shouldn't, like they are expensive kits and they they should be used because they're often very, very well developed. They've been well thought out of, or at least like you can see parts of what you would need from them, you know? So one of the things that I did two years ago, a couple of years ago, I guess, that was really exciting for me was I did a diagnostic project with a school that we took diagnostics with Prime for both number and operation for all students grade one through four. We did this at one site and there was about 20 to 25 kids in each class that we worked with. And so one of the things that we did is our goal was to learn about the prime diagnostic for the year and to see if using a diagnostic would impact our teaching focus. And surprise, surprise, it really did. (laughs) It was actually shocking how much it impacted how we thought about the students, what their skills were and what we would do. So the first thing we did is we broke down the prime package. We looked to see what it was. We saw that there was the five phases. We looked to see what it meant to be pre-phase, what the curriculum grade levels were that were associated with the phases so that we had a good idea of when kids were at appropriate ages. And we just sort of kind of got used to what the kit looked like in packaging. And then I went and for primary, it's pretty heavily interview-based. And so you either would need a couple of days as a teacher just to do all the interviews, or you'd have to space it out over a couple of weeks and just to do them one by one. You know what I mean? It takes about two days just to get all the kids through. And that was the one thing about our primary diagnostic project that was beautiful is that there was somebody attached to be able to do that, that could read the data. So once we took the data, all the scores, you either get two or one or zero on each question. And so what we did is we color coded them on a spreadsheet and we had every kid entered into a class list and we coded it so that like green was, you got two points on a question and yellow was one point and zero was red. But what it did is it automatically switched all of those values so that it was color coded and you could see in our grade one class when we looked at it, there was a hard line of red for every student because they couldn't bond to five. So when we have kids entering in grade one and they don't know that like one finger and four fingers make five and it's a really clear hard line, that's like your first thing you're going to work on with your class because that's something that they should already have or should be working on in the first couple of months. But it bonds to five they should have by the end of senior kindergarten. And so that was something like we referenced the curriculum, we'd check back against what should kids already have and what should we be learning through the year. So when we got to the operations diagnostic and they couldn't add past, I think one of the questions is like seven plus four or something, that's age level appropriate because getting over the 10 is something they're learning to do in grade one. So when you see that first test A, that they hit like a wall really quickly in operations, that makes sense for grade one because they haven't learned a lot of operations. But for number sense, half of that first one should be green. But you would, of course, expect, you would expect certain things like the positioning and ordinal numbers. Like you expect them to have a certain amount of ordinal numbers already before moving on. So the thing that was really great about the diagnostics is that you had this whole class list 
and your whole class would be read on one question. So you would go and think about like, what are all the questions that are like this one? What's the curriculum? What do we need to do here, right? Yeah. And so then we would have our curriculum out and we would go, okay, let's cross reference. And then we'd highlight everything in the curriculum all the way through all the strands that was related to that question. And they're like, okay, so when we're teaching this, we have to come back and hit this harder every time. And then one of the things that we did that this is actually really neat is, so we used, what are the books called? Taking Shape and What to Look For. And we took all the games out of those books and we related them back to wherever there was an issue in the whole class problems. Like, so on the diagnostic, anywhere there was majority of the class was read on a question. And we took those games and used them as gap closure methods. And we took all of our daily number talks and we used them to gap close. And then once we closed a gap, then we'd use those number talks to start to promote new curriculum. Love it. Love it. That's a great rundown of Prime. And I know we've got a boatload of additional questions to kind of dive into. And I know in our district, actually, Prime was sort of introduced to our district by Anne Pijon. She was a student success officer at the ministry and now is back in the classroom in uh, Thames Valley is the district that she was coming from. So Anne helped our district, helped expose us to Prime. And we've done a lot of work with the number and operations kit. And like you've described here, it's so important that it's not like an assessment where it's like you want all your kids to be green necessarily. Depending on the tool that you use, they might be exactly where you're hoping based on the curriculum and developmentally. And you'll still see some red because those were concepts that you'll either be dressing that year or maybe in future years. So it really gives you just kind of a, we'll call it like a bird's eye view of where students are. And and the questions are very simple. Like, for example, one that I'm going to throw out, I can't remember which tool. Sometimes the questions appear on more than once, like on one tool and on another tool. And it was written in standard form for fractions. And I believe it was nine over 10. Is it closer to zero or one, or it was yeah. something along those lines, yeah, or it might've been a decimal, one zero tenth, decimal nine. One tenth closer to zero. One or, tenth. And then it's like, is zero decimal nine or, or nine tenths uh, closer, but it was all, And you can yeah. always ask them like how they know, right? Which is great if you're actually doing like interview style or ask them to model it. But how many students will say one tenth is closer to one because there's a one in the fraction? Or at least that's the assumption you might make or you ask them why. And it is shocking. Or when they ask to place a fraction on a number line between zero and one, very telling of what's happening here. So I'm right with you. I'm connected. But I know John's there and I know John is less familiar with Prime. So John, I think, has a couple questions, some clarifying questions for you. So hit us, John, with a question that you or someone who's listening might have who aren't familiar with Prime. That's me. The uh, I was going to think of the alternate angle here, but Kat, I'm wondering, Kyla, being you both have had consultant experience and also high school teaching experience. Like I'm just a high school teacher, not a consultant. So I don't have a lot of elementary experience in this with what Kyla said about Prime and other diagnostic packages. But I'm wondering first, is like this diagnostic assessment is like iterative, like every strand? Or is this something you do at the beginning of the year and then you keep track of it over time? Or is this like you had kind of alluded to earlier, like every lesson or every couple lessons? Can you give me a time frame on what this kind of looks like? Just so listeners also know what we're kind of getting into. Yeah, no, perfect. So what I usually do with diagnostics is, so in high school, I gave, like for grade nines, I would do the diagnostic like the first week, but intermingled with like other activities. So we might be doing like a activity from the imagination or not the imagination week from one of like Joe Bowler's activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, Inspirational math. Thank you. That's what it is. But once we've like worked on an activity for a little while, then we'd take a portion of the class and work on a diagnostic for part of the class, just to have like calm, quiet dance before we leave the room. And so then to get one of the diagnostic sets, it'll take about an hour 
So if I've split it across a couple of days, I'll only give them a certain number of the pages and then check them as I go. But then what I can do is I mark them and then come back to the kids. So if there was a student that did particularly low on only on just the fractions, but they were fine with the decimals, when I call them up to go over the diagnostics, I have them all set a goal. I'll talk to them first before I set the goal. It's just about like, I noticed that you did this, but you were fine when it was in decimal form. So I'm just curious, like, how do you feel about fractions? What do you think about them? Is it something that you feel really strong? It's a skill set that you have, or is it something that sometimes you feel like you know what you're doing, or sometimes you struggle with it, or whatever? And I let them talk. And usually, what happens is if they have something like that, where it's like one form they're really strong at, and one they're not, they've been using a calculator since the introduction of fractions, and they've just associated the decimal number with that fraction, and they've never learned how to deal with the fraction. So they actually have a huge gap of what fractions are. And so it's something that when you're talking about fractions, you have to like go back and remediate all the time, all the way through the course. And so when you realize that, that's so important for the instructional practice for the rest of the semester. But it's making sure that that's like a clear note in your planning documents, right? That that for like maybe five kids have that happen when you come into grade nine. So that always happens within the first two weeks where I get the number diagnostic side done and the operation done. And then what I do with that is I have the kids make like individual learning goals. So some kids will be like, they'll cap out and they'll be fine. Like their diagnostic says that they're right at the grade level for all topics. So I'll have those kids create independent goals based on communication. Like what's your communication goal for math this year? How will we communicate to other people orally with diagrams or with my written work what's your goal and so the kids who need the more specialized gap closure goals we go through and we find things in their diagnostics and those diagnostic pieces will inform what their goal is so i had one student last year whose goal was to be able to move between fractions and decimals more fluently and so what they did is their parents wanted to support because they were sure that their child had a gap because I'd called home and talked to the parents as well. And they were sure that their kid was going to have a gap on this diagnostic. And so the parents asked for gap closing documents to be sent home. And so we use the Edugain's gap closure. I can't remember what it's called. Gap closing, I think. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Um, that's what it is. And so we sent that home and they worked on some of that independently. And then every once in a while, I would check in with that student. So it was a lot more like, because your gaps in grade nine, because it's been streamed, some of the gaps are big for some of the kids, but usually you'll only have one or two that are big gaps in one stream. And then when you're looking at like another stream, so say you're in the applied class, like you'll have gaps, but there'll be more whole class gaps. The way that it's streamed has actually made it so the gap closures can be, some of them, you'll have the odd one that's like very deep but it's, they are closable. Like we can get there. It's just whether or not the kid wants to commit to it or not, because it is work and it's work for them. Yeah. And that kind of just brings up, I think one of our last questions here is that, especially in the beginning of the school year, we're trying to set the stage for that math class might be different than your previous math classes. We've talked a lot about that here on the podcast on like, we want our class to be a welcoming place. We want it to be a place of growth. And it makes sense to set these goals up for students. And when they see the results of a diagnostic assessment, I'm wondering how are you helping students with say math anxiety around taking a test or short diagnostics. I know that when I do this in high school, when I say we're going to do a diagnostic early on, you can see the anxiety levels rising because they're thinking, all right, already at the beginning of the year, I have a test to take. They, it's hard for them to differentiate between diagnostic and test and because they really think it means I'm getting assessed on skills, but it's going to be yeah. evaluative. Like I'm wondering how you're helping your students or the students that you've uh, helped in the past deal with, say, communicating mindset around using diagnostics or having them take a diagnostic so early? Yeah. So one of the things that I do with my classes is I'll call ahead and talk to parents. 
and just let them know, like, this is how my class is structured. We do spiral. I do diagnostics very early on. The diagnostics are not used to change pathways. Like they're not used in any way to grade your child. They're used for my planning and to help your child set goals in math class. And so having that communicated home, I think is huge because it helps with parents understanding so that they know what's happening and they'll be able to talk to their kids as it comes up. And then when I hand them out before I do that, we've usually had a few classes where we've been doing other things and some activities. And so by the time that they get the diagnostic, they've been prepped for it in terms of like, we've had conversations leading up to it. And I do always say like, this is not something to worry about. I don't want you to like you will not be graded on this in any way. You're not being judged. What this is doing is helping me plan. And if we have gaps, is it better to close them or is it better to let them grow? And so most of the kids get that idea. And because it's like something that we regularly come back to, they want to close the gaps and they want to show you their growth. It's funny because in different situations, like across the consulting role and across the classroom, I've had kids who they didn't get something on a diagnostic. And because we had like practiced it a few times, or we had done some work, they've come back and said, all right, I need you to reassess me now. Because I want you to like interview me so you can see that I get this now. And then you can like, change my diagnostic. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I'm not going to change that diagnostic, but I will update it so that it's there. Because I want you to see how much growth you had, and how often, right? And that Every time you're willing to put the work in, this is what's going to happen. Right. I love that. And we're looking at the time and we're going to be wrapping up in in just a couple minutes. But I'm so happy that we had the opportunity to dive as deep as we did with a particular tool to give people a sense of what that means to you, to Kat, and to myself as well. In my role, I look at that diagnostic and they can be used for good or for evil. Right. I mean, and and it sounds like you're using them and by using the diagnostic and informing your practice, informing yourself of where students are along their journey and ensuring that they know that it's about them and their learning journey as well is so imperative. And I just think it's great for you as you're planning ahead and trying to figure how you can design your math lessons. Like it sounds like we often say we used to plan our lessons with no students in mind or that one student right in the middle or that one student who's right where they're supposed to be. And what you're doing is you're opening the door to get a better sense of where are students at, where are they feeling good, that So I don't have to, I don't want to say it's a waste, but it is sort of a waste of time. It could be better used if I focus on something that they're struggling on versus something that they're clearly comfortable with and doing well on. So I love that. And it sounds like your assessment practice really promotes that growth mindset and that reducing anxiety piece. So I want to thank you so much, Kat, for uh, sharing your perspectives on the importance of diagnostics for our math classrooms. And we'll be sure to wrap up all those links with a bow in the show notes, including a link to Prime if folks are interested. It is what my district uses as well, but there are many others out there. So we're not suggesting it's the only or it's the absolute best. It's the one that we've been exposed to in our district, and it does a great job with getting us started along that journey. So So Kat, where can folks find more about you in case they want to touch base, connect, ask you some questions about diagnostics and assessment? So I am on Twitter. My handle is at goslink123. So it's G-O-S-L-I-N-K-123. And I answer DMs pretty regularly. And anytime anybody wants to talk, I'm very happy to connect. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Kat, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And I know I've got some great insights on diagnostics and some other ideas that definitely help me and shape the way I view, say, using those tools in my class. So thanks so much. And I know that listeners are also kind of nodding their heads too. So uh, we want to thank you for joining us here and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your lovely day. Thank you. 
We want to thank Kat again for spending some time with us today to share her ideas and her insights around diagnostics and feedback and all kinds of wonderful work that you, the Math Moment Maker community, I'm sure finds valuable and are always looking to build on as we try to reach every learner in our math classroom. In order to ensure you don't miss out on new episodes as they come out each Monday morning, uh, be sure to subscribe over on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform and know that we have lots of new content happening over at YouTube each week. That's right, John. We are spending a ton of time doing Facebook Lives and uploading new videos each week to YouTube to help you, the Math Moment Maker community. So make sure you head over to YouTube and smash that subscribe button. Also, hit that notification bell. And uh, remember, you can find us on all social media platforms by searching for Make Math Moments, whether it's on Twitter, Instagram, and even on Facebook. We've got a page over there and a Facebook group. So check it out. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 125. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 125. Yes, and you get all kinds of goodies over on that show notes page. So not only those links and resources, but downloadable transcripts. So make sure you check it out. And uh, my friends, we are looking forward to the next episode next week. So until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high five for you.